There's Matt. Great. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us on our Deep Sense Discovery session. I'm going to tell you really quickly about Deep Sense because some people might not have an awareness of what it is that we do. Um, Deep Sense was created by all of these fantastic partners and funders that you see on this screen. And the reason why these organizations all got together to create Deep Sense was to help ocean related companies explore artificial intelligence, machine learning, and visualizations to better advance the supply chain in the ocean ecosystem. So it's all about the ocean sector and helping companies better use their data to advance their business or make them more efficient. In deep sense, what we find is some companies really either don't know where they could go with AI, with machine learning and visualizations, they might not have skill sets or expertise, even if they do in their company have the skill set and expertise to do some certain things like you'll, Matt will tell us a lot about um, the world of AI. Sometimes organizations don't have the capacity to explore incremental new things that may not always have a guaranteed return, or they don't have the infrastructure and software to help. Well, that's where DeepSense comes into play. We have resources. We partner students with academic researchers. We have, uh, uh, we have infrastructure that is on-premise that we maintain, and we have lots of software and support. Our partner of IBM has provided us with millions of dollars worth of software and support that also helps us to do very interesting projects. And the goal with DeepSense is that we help companies explore opportunities. We pair them up with researchers. We help scope out projects and try to identify funding sources. Our students work with the companies in developing a solution. Maybe it's a prototype, maybe it's functional code, maybe it's just a proof of concept. When they're finished, we try to give that back to the company so they can leverage it for commercialization purposes. And then the students want to graduate. So sometimes they publish papers or reports. And then really the goal then is we have someone who graduates as well that really understands the ocean ecosystem and knows there's a career opportunity in the ocean ecosystem. So deep sense has two main criteria or two main goals. We're looking to develop proofs of concept prototype and code for companies. And we're also looking to really grow the commercializable tech sector skills that really help grow the ocean economy. And that's why we exist and companies like Matt are fascinating companies because they align with us really well. So we look forward to you joining us. And thanks very much. So for an introduction, Matt uh, is an incredible, talented business founder. So Real Data has been part of Creative Destruction Labs. It's been part of Techstars out of Montreal. He and the team have um, really grown their business very quickly and creatively. And they're using technology that isn't always available to establish companies. Some startups don't have the skill set and the knowledge and the expertise to go and create a company using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So this is the fascinating part about where Matt comes into play. I'm really excited to have Matt share with us about real data. So take it away, Matt. Uh, um... Thanks, Jen. Um, that was very nice. So, as Jen was saying, uh, I am one of the co-founders of Real Data. We, we are building AI to help aquaculture companies. Um, my co-founder and I met at Dalhousie University a few years ago um, through a local accelerator here in Halifax called Propel ICT. And after that, we realized that we wanted to do a startup and teased some ideas around for about a year and a half before we stumbled on to real data. Um, and I just want to start, I guess, with who I am and then who real data is, and then I can walk everybody through a, a PowerPoint that I have uh, that kind of overviews the company, the pains, the problems uh, of aquaculture companies, our technology, um, and then I guess we can open it up to questions as well as uh, I think Jen might have some questions as well. But um, I was born and raised in northern Manitoba. I moved here in, to Halifax, Nova Scotia to do my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, where I completed that and then worked for a large oil field company called Schlumberger for a few years before I went back and did my master's degree in computer science. Um, and then I guess who real data is, it is a team full of computer scientists. Uh, our team is comprised mainly of people with a graduate degree in either machine learning or computer vision. Um, and as Jen said, we have uh, went through a number of um, accelerators such as Techstars AI, which was in Montreal, and it is um, really the world's foremost AI accelerator. So we um, built our network up with people in 
the AI industry that have built large companies, large AI companies. Um, we spoke with people from Mila Institute there, um, which if you're unfamiliar with it, it is really the place for AI globally. So uh, Montreal was great for us for the months we were there and we still have a huge network there. Um, and then with that, I can just kind of go right into the presentation I have about our company and about aquaculture. And then um, if anybody has any questions, uh, just hit, uh, I guess, type in the chat or open your, open your mic and uh, we can talk. All right, um, so everybody can see this, Jen? I can see it, we're good. Great. Um, so, um, as I said, I'm Matt Zmola, um, and Real Data is developing technology to help uh, feed billions of people. And I guess everybody over, the last couple of weeks has looking, been looking at exponential functions. And on the left, you could see how the aquaculture industry is currently growing um, in comparison to capture fisheries. So this industry is, has been just exploding over the recent years with uh, companies coming here to Nova Scotia, as well as rapidly growing land-based uh, ecosystem. Um, and I, just, I guess I took this from a all this data was uh, from the FAO by the person that uh, kind of displayed it nicely was at the link at the bottom there. And what we are doing within the industry is we're solving three pain points that were identified to us after speaking with the uh, fish farmers. So they are wanting to know how much their fish weigh, how much should they be feeding the fish, and how healthy are their fish? What is the current state of health and welfare of their fish? And in order to do this, a team of people will go to a site like this once a month, and each, each of those pens there, they'll pull up a boat, they'll net out a sample of a couple hundred salmon, they'll bring them onto the boat, they'll anesthetize them, and then they'll take these fish out one by one, they'll weigh them, they will uh, write down any metrics, um, with respect to sea lice or any, uh, any uh, health metrics. And then they'll put these fish back into the pens. And then they usually write this down uh, on, a, on a piece of paper before. Oh, I have a, uh, are my slides advancing for everybody or I had a? No, we're uh, only seeing the first slide. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, give me a second here then. How about that? Yeah, that's good. Yep. Okay, I'll just go this way then. Uh, so this was the exponential graph. So as you can see, aquaculture has been exploding since uh, in the 90s uh, with respect to captured fisheries. Um, and then I stated that uh, in real, our world in data is people that uh, made this graph for us um, that took all the data from FAO. And then this slide was explaining that um, the three pain points we're solving was how much do my fish weigh, how much should I be feeding my fish, and how healthy or what is the current state of health and welfare of my fish. And this is a, a site, an aquaculture site, in which a team of people will go out from pen to pen to pen every single month, uh, approximately every 30 days, and they will net out a sample between 200 and 300 fish. They'll bring them onto a boat, anesthetize them, uh, where they take them out one by one, they weigh these fish, they visually inspect them, and they write all these metrics down on a piece of paper before putting the fish back into the pen. Um, and these metrics are um, not um, perfectly accurate. They are also time consuming. And um, these methods really uh, introduce or bring in uh, a factor of uncertainty when it comes to the industry uh, with respect to mortality rate and fish feed. So if you're these farms and you are weighing these fish to 
understand how much to feed them and you are taking them out January 1st and you are 95% accurate um, and then you have a growth model over time for the next month that decreases in accuracy. So you're 95% accurate January 1st, but then January 15th, um, what you think is in the pen might be 90% accurate. And by the time you get to January 30th, you might be at 85 or 80% accurate on the mean weight uh, of fish within that pen. So they're feeding on these metrics. And then they're also, if you're 25% inaccurate, you're either overfeeding or underfeeding fish. Uh, which is very costly. This, uh, this fish feed ends up, is very expensive, so it'll either end up sitting on the bottoms of oceans and rivers as they're overfeeding it, or they will underfeed their fish and uh, not maximize the proper growth. Um, and what we are doing is we're using machine learning to, do, to solve these pain points. So we're weighing fish daily and providing metrics on health and um, weight and fish feed every single day for these fish farms. So, we built the solution. Um, there's our stereo camera in the top right there. Uh, that's CAD drawing of it. Um, but I, I don't know if too many of you are familiar with the stereoscopic camera, but it works like your eyeballs do. So you have a depth perception. So as fish, as, as fish are passing our camera, we are able to know how far away they are from the camera. And then we can determine the exact uh, metrics of them, um, length, height, um, I guess, circumference of the fish. And then we put that data into our biomass model, which produces the weight of the fish. So, um, and then the center thing in the camera there is a light because um, we are both, both working on ocean-based and land-based fish farms. So uh, we use the lights because um, some land-based fish farms are a little bit darker or on a cloudy day or on a darker day, it is very hard to see fish. So. Um, I'll get into that later, but there's a lot of uh, challenges when creating hardware for oceans um, that we've tackled with, um, and lighting was one of them. Um, and then I guess I'll dive a little bit into how the technology works with our camera system. So I stated a second ago that we were using a stereoscopic camera and it works like your eyes. So if you can imagine each of these two images as uh, your right eye and your left eye, um, there's a disparity difference. So basically a disparity is kind of the difference you see when you close one eye and then you um, close the other eye and open one eye. Everything kind of shifts a little bit. So the way we get the depth uh, from the camera to the fish is using a little bit of math um, with these two images. So we know the pixel differences between, uh, if you can see the nose on that salmon in the center there, on the right image, the nose is closer to the left of the frame. And then in the left image, the nose is more in the center of the frame. So we take the difference in pixels and then we can get the depth of the camera to those salmon. Um, and then we end up using that disparity to calculate the weight of the image. And I will show you a video right now. Pop it open. All right, can everybody see the video that I just opened? Yes. Great. Uh, so this is the live video feed from a farm, a land-based fish farm. And as we take the disparity, we do a semantic mask and then we can take the circumference of the fish as, as well as various points, um, I guess landmarks, top of the dorsal fin, the eyeball, and then take those points and it's thematic segmentation and put it through our biomass model, which shows that this fish actually weighs 5.23 pounds. Um, and that's basically how our biomass model works. Uh, there's a lot more into the data set and the models used, but uh, the high level overview is that's what we're doing with our camera to produce a weight of a fish. 
and then I we also did a pellet detection, which um, if you can imagine when fish are feeding in one of these pens, uh, the fish feed comes from the surface and fish will eat the feed as it uh, drops to the bottom of the pen. We can place cameras within these fish pens to determine whether or not fish are eating or whether or not uh, food is being wasted on the bottom of lakes and oceans. And I will show you some of the AI that we created that can do this. So this video I'm about to show you Um, it's gonna, the fish farm is gonna start uh, feeding their fish and you'll see pellets dropping down. And then we did a neural net that basically classifies uh, an object detection model of uh, the pellets uh, as they're falling. So, And as you can see, this camera is on the bottom. So one of the pellets is actually going to hit on the top of the lens there. So that would actually be a waste, waste of fish feed, which um, fish feed is the number one expense on every single fish farm, every single fin fish farm globally. So um, reducing the amount of waste of feed is extremely important for these fish farmers. So um, automating this system, and reducing the amount of waste of feed is very, very important for uh, farmers we're working with. And I'll get back to PowerPoint. Great. Um, and um, like, I guess, extrapolating that to a typical farm, um, that would attribute to two million dollars in losses in overfeeding and five to eight million dollars with those two metrics I brought up earlier. Um, here. Uh, that attributes to that monetary value on a typical farm. So these farms are losing up to $10 million, over $10 million a year uh, through mortality in either wasted or underfed fish. And extrapolating that globally, that's $30 billion in losses for the industry, which is absolutely insane. Um, which kind of shows, this is a really big problem. And to show that, uh, Google just entered our industry about three weeks ago, four weeks ago with their company called Tidal. They were a secret Google X project that was working for the last three years with a large ocean based company and they released their AIs, their, their models and their research over the last three years about a, three or four weeks ago. Um, so these are just very, very big problems, um, which we are tackling, tackling with that camera system on farms like this. Um, th I guess this picture was taken in February this year as we were traveling one of our camera systems. Um, and that's me uh, putting one of the camera systems in the water. And this is uh, my co-founder Hussein uh, tying off one of the three camera systems we put in that pen. Um, this is a little bit a uh, closer look at the camera. We have uh, actually upgraded our camera system now. So we have four lights. Uh, there's no light in the center. And instead of stereoscopic, we have three uh, camera sensors now. So, and there's the final picture of a land-based fish farm that our camera is on as well. So um, that's basically an overview of the company, some of the technology we're dealing with and some of the pain points and problems that fish farms um, are using our AI for. Um, I guess that's really the end of the presentation I had. So if anybody has any questions or uh, if Jen wants to say anything, great. Um, have some other stuff that we could talk about as well. I think that's great. Thanks. I think that's, um, I just realized I don't have a, an image on. Sorry about that. I wasn't dressed appropriately for um, my face to be up here today. <laughs> Who is? Um, so I think one of the big things um, for me is it's fascinating. You've gone and you've taken a need in the marketplace, identified it and researched it and built a solution around it. And kudos because it's, 
an incredible thing to do, especially after someone having recently graduated as well. And I think because um, part of our focus is also on machine learning and AI, is there anything that you can talk about that's, that's some of the, the challenges that you've run into or um, like finding data, analyzing your data, storing your data? Oh man, um, I'm noticing now that uh, two of the team members from Real Data are actually um, in the chat, so I'm sure their microphones are muted, but they would have a lot to say. But challenges, yeah, there's so many. Um, the first time, so Will, it was me, Hussein, and Will, uh, one of our machine learning engineers. This time last year, we were starting to acquire data. Um, and I guess the hardest part that we've encountered so far was building a data set. Um, First, if you're starting a company um, like ours, you don't have fish. So you have to find a partner, an organization, a research institute, a fish farm that'll let you go weigh fish, take images of fish. So um, we got lucky with um, a local company here in Nova Scotia that's some value in um, innovation within the land-based aquaculture industry. So we've been working with them every week for the last over a year but for the first three months myself Hussein and Will were going out um, to this fish farm and we would leave Halifax at about 4 30 in the morning as they're harvesting fish which was uh, the time that they said we can go take images and weigh fish they were harvesting um, super early so we would go there in January and February when it's super cold um, right next to this um, open wide open door in a fish farm so it's minus 15 out and myself Hussein or Will are all are taking um, fish out of this giant bin and weighing them we have this um, as we're taking the images we have uh, an object that um, was a known size so a toonie that we spray painted green that we thought great we know the diameter in millimeters as we take the pictures of fish um, we could use that as a landmark in order to um, calculate the size of each individual salmon. But uh, after three months, we realized that our models were not generalizing and we dove more into it. And I guess uh, there was issues with distortion on the images uh, on an image. So the pixel values of the toonie were different than the pixel values of the actual fish. So we had um, bad data, I guess, for the first three months. And if you're doing anything with machine learning, uh, garbage in equals garbage out. So uh, that data, we still have all the images. Maybe we haven't figured out what we could actually do with it, but we had to completely redesign how we were taking images and uh, make sure that what we were doing, we weren't actually wasting another three months. So um, myself, Lucy and Will ended up um, pulling a couple long days and late nights to figure out what the appropriate way to take images was and obtain data so that we didn't screw this up again. So um, since then, um, we have been able to build a model to, I think, uh, an R squared accuracy of 0.96. So it's, it's really good right now. Um, and the companies we're working with um, seem very excited with what we're doing. That's incredible. And um, the, the whole challenge, like sometimes when students are in school, they, they're given uh, data already or data that's been partially cleaned or, you know, it's finding and actually going through the methodology, having to collect your own data is, is pretty monumental, right? So it's a, a fascinating thing that sometimes until you're really in your own business or building a business out that you realize the challenge with getting, getting the data in the first place. It's not like you guys were camera ex experts. No, that was hands down the hardest thing we've done. Um, there's a couple other hard things that we've had to tackle along the way, but getting data, keeping, um, going back to a farm and telling them that the last three months was a, a waste, well, not a waste, but um, wasn't useful for a model is, is a tough pill to swallow. So hands down, getting the data and understanding how to actually create the data was most challenging or 
most challenging, most time consuming thing we've done. I can only imagine. Now, and some of the questions, please feel free for others to jump in for questions. But one of the questions that I'd sent to you, because the goal of Deep Sense is we work with companies like you, and we also work with students and try to help students uh, better position themselves. So I sent you a couple of questions in advance, but one I'm really curious about of the things you learned during your master's, for example, or during your academic studies, is there anything that you can think of that's been really applicable so that you've taken from something you learned while you were in school and either maybe you learned and you leveraged it or you wish you'd maybe paid more attention to? Um, yeah, so there was a, a newer professor when I was doing my master's degree at Dow. His name was Robert Hockey and he was probably the best, best class I took at the university. And um, I think that uh, just understanding in a university that what you're doing with academia is a little bit different than what you're doing in industry is uh, was probably the biggest takeaway that uh, I got from the Dalhousie um, master's program. I did have work experience coming into it. So after my undergraduate degree, I did work for a few years with Slumberjay. So uh, I knew a little bit about that, but um, that was probably the biggest takeaway out of any of the courses I did do at the Dalhousie program itself. That's, it's very true. And I think, yes, anyone who's ever worked it and try to partner up with academic institutions, sometimes there's a bit of a split between the two. So trying to find some people who have good experience or exposure or different thinking is, is very helpful. One, one of my last questions then is, um, if a student were applying to try to work with you, what would you be looking for from them? So if they're about, they're graduating, what would you hope that they can highlight they took away from their own ac academic experience? Um, I think that every the member every member of our team is all more or less educated in a master's degree, but um, they have their ability to solve problems is, um, and understand what the goals are for the experiment they're doing and how they could really reach those goals and why what they're doing is important um, is really important for us. Uh, as a team, um, we lost some hours um, working on computer code or models that may uh, not have been pushing the needle forward for the company. Um, so we're always looking for people that, I guess, really have those that skill set. So um, my actual my co-founder and myself actually see value or disagree a little bit on who we should hire um but everybody that we've taken on within the company has really had these traits so um i guess within our company specifically there were 100 percent cs either are we have two undergrads in the company but uh, the four full-time people are uh all have masters in computer science um and they all are able to work independently, um, know how to push the needle forward on a startup. So they're all pretty good with understanding how chaotic uh, a company could be. Um, some days we'll go into meetings. Um, and I guess myself or Hussein or somebody else on the team will have to change things up that somebody's been working on for the last couple of days. And it, it's a tough pill to swallow but we'll have to kind of switch out uh, and start working on other things. Um, but more or less, it's just being able to understand the goals of the company and be able to move the needle forward every single day. Fantastic. Um, now, for those of you who are uh, online, I can, I think I can unmute you, um, but you should be able to unmute yourselves. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to either message them or um, ask We have some students that are deep sense students as well. I'm curious to see if any of them have any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when you were developing the model to, you know, to, to look at the images and determine the size of the fish, how, what did you use for ground truth on that?
Matt? Did we lose Matt? I'm not sure what happened here. Part of the, um, I guess, when we were talking, Jen was um, kind of understanding how CS and ocean companies or ocean science kind of connect. And I did write down a, a lot of pain points that we experienced within the last year that I could probably go over as well. Um, I did touch on the data set build, um, but uh, there's really four or five other things that we have had challenges with, um, such as um, in oceans, if you are in this industry, you have to get uh, your data from a source and that source is usually hardware. So the easiest way to break uh, hardware is to put it in the ocean. So um, that is something that was super challenging for us was the fact that we have these little tiny computers with a camera um, that we have had to put into the Halifax Harbor, land-based um, fish farms, ocean-based fish farms, and we have broken a lot of them a lot of camera systems, a lot of GPUs, um, because really ocean electronics, ocean and electronics don't mix. Um, and with that, when you're building hardware like we are, um, it's really expensive to iterate. So the first camera system, the ones that we um, piloted with, uh, we took down all of our hypothesis of the issues that these systems were going to encounter within ocean and land-based fish farms. So we developed a, what we thought was a super rugged system. It didn't end up being, the cables ended up breaking, the lighting systems weren't in the proper place. So we were getting backscatter and hot spots on the fish. Um, so we ended up iterating our camera system again and uh, changing the lights around as well as adding an, another uh, camera sensor in order to um, get more data. So those were really the two biggest problems with us was um, building a data set and uh, as a bunch of computer scientists properly building an underwater computer. Awesome. Um, one of the other questions that um, that was asked by uh, definitely by a student talking about, you know, getting the the most out of their master's degree. If you could redo your differently, I have a feeling that finally, I guess um, ocean conditions are super challenging as well. So. Everything changes in the ocean. Temperature, pressure, uh, the tides. Uh, when we went out to an ocean farm, we learned that the tides were changing, moving our camera systems from an angle like this to an angle like this. So we were seeing the bellies of fish instead of the side on for our, our algorithms, uh, which uh, I guess really the whole thing is to end up trialing your camera systems. Turbidity, light, Particulates, backscatter was all something that changes from site to site, so from pen to pen, from land based to ocean based. Um, so, in order to build, tie that into the conditions, to tie it into how we build the hardware, to tie it into how we're sending the data from a pen to the cloud is uh, was uh, challenging and fun, I guess, in the last year. We learned a lot. Uh, I think the clients we're working with are super excited about what we're doing. Um, and we have been moving extremely fast. So um, our next steps are scaling out with companies we're here that are here in, in North America and getting over to really the big uh, sand market in Norway next year as well as Chile. Awesome. Can you hear me, Matt? No. Okay. I don't think Matt can hear me and I'm not really sure um, if any of his colleagues can text him and let him know too. Um, I think this has been super helpful and it's yeah. kind of funny. Sorry. Oh, there we go. 
Yeah. We were well, chatting. There, a little bit. there were there were some questions. <laughs> oh, okay. So Pedram just messaged me on Slack and let me know my speaker was on mute. So I was speaking for a while. So this is great. And you covered off some stuff. So know that we cared and we were asking questions. <laughs> Jason, do you want to go back and ask yours? <laughs> Yeah, sorry. I, I was just wondering what you use for uh, ground truth when you're uh, developing the model to to determine the size of the fish. Yeah, we created our own data set. So we took images of fish, and weighed them, and each image that we saved had a weight of a fish, and we did that for over a year at this point. So we're continuously weighing fish. We're continuously building our data set. Um, and um, yeah, that's I for the first three months we screwed it up um, and we created a new way to actually take images of fish in order to build this data set up. And I think um, within the last, I guess, month or so, I think we're even going to iterate on that and build a more accurate way to take images of fish in order to build a more accurate, accurate biomass model. So I guess the high level overview was it was us going and snapping a picture of a salmon or char or trout and basically saving the file name or uh, or manifest as a, a weight of the fish in order to build up our, our, our model. So you did actually like, I don't know, catch or have access to that specific fish? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we partnered with a land-based farm that was either harvesting or obtaining weight samples. So when they harvest their fish, um, uh, before they go to market, um, there's essentially a fish that's uh, been killed. And then we would take that, um, take a picture of it, take the weight, and then uh, save it to our, our models as well as when they're doing sampling. So when they're before harvest, say they're harvest fish are usually around anywhere between online based farms, eight pounds to 10 pounds. So when they're at in, in the middle of the growth period at four, four or three pounds, they do samples every single month and they take these fish out. So we would take them as they're sampling them, they take them out, they're unconscious because they knock them out with an anesthetic they weigh them, so then we would sneak in there and we would take a fish out and snap picks uh, with them as well. And then build up our data set that way. But it was oh, well over a year at this point now that we've been doing that. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of images of fish. Cool. Thanks. Super labor intensive and I think the climate is probably, I think you said early in the morning and freezing cold. So it sounds yeah. very exciting. <laughs> Um, one of the other questions that we had was from a student, Matt, and she was asking about your experience during your master's and it was, if you could do it all over again. If I could do it all over again, would I, or? Well, how about if you could, what would you do differently? So maybe, how about, maybe there's a question for you. Yeah. Would you do it? Would you do differently if you had continued? Um, no, I would definitely do the master's degree probably change up the approach and tweak it a little bit, but other than that, um, not too much. It was great. I learned a lot. I came from an engineering background, so um, being able to jump into a master's in computer science, which uh, I had no experience with, was great for me. Um, so in that sense, no. Um, I'm assuming some of these, most of these are Dalhousie students. Um, it's all over the board. There's a bunch, a bunch of institutions. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, um, there was one specific in Steep Senses Dow. Uh, his name is Robert Hockey at Dow. Uh, best classes I took was with him. Um, a lot of the stuff I've learned specific, like, specifically were with respect to machine learning were self-study. So, um, but uh, for me coming out of a chemical engineering background where I didn't write any computer code in my undergraduate degree. I didn't do anything to an extent in my professional career with Slumberjay. Uh, getting into that degree was highly beneficial for myself specifically. It definitely opens completely new doors and changes direction. So the next question we have is for all students coming from computer science that don't have industry knowledge of ocean science or fish sustainability, 
how would you go out about learning more about the subject? So one, as a plug, that's part of Deep Sense's role. That's part of what we're trying to do by introducing you to Matt and to other topics of oceans. But Matt, you guys, I don't know how much you want to talk about how you guys navigated to figure out, how did you figure out the subject, the an area that none of you had an experience in? Yeah, um, start reaching out to people. Um, pick up the phone. I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, so this time last year, I guess, I'd say 15 months ago, I didn't know anybody in the aquaculture industry. Now I'm connected with a large, uh, large portion of people from the bigger companies like uh, Cook Aquaculture to Marine Harvest, now they're Maui to the aquaculture tech companies um, at um, some of our, I guess, competitors at Steinsvik or ACFA. Uh, just reach out to people and talk. Everybody within whatever industry, especially if you're in university, everybody's happy to talk to a person finishing off their degree. So one of our strategies actually was to, as we were starting the company, was to leverage that and say, that we, at the time we were, we were doing research and we were reaching out to people and saying, listen, we're doing research in aquaculture. Uh, do you have time for a quick 15 minute chat? Nine times out of 10, we got a phone call with people in Norway, people in Australia, people in Chile. So if you don't have industry, reach out to people. And that's really what worked for us. Fantastic. Um, and going back to, there was a, you know, we briefly touched on what you'd hire, what students, what you'd look for for skills from those you hire, what technical skills would you expect from any future staff? Um, depending on the role, like if we're hiring for a machine learning engineer job, I'd like to see the fact that they know something about machine learning, but um, none, like everything, as long as you could we're always changing things around. So like, I didn't know too much about computer vision and how to learn it. So the biggest skill is the ability to learn and the ability to like show that you can learn and you have the drive to, uh, yeah, self learn with all the stuff that's going on within the company. So we're doing computer vision, we're doing machine learning, we're doing hardware. So if you can come in and sit down and to learn the stuff we're doing great um the background is in the end and i guess it, specifically if we're hiring for for a machine learning or a hardware engineer it's nice to have that sets those sets of skills to an extent but um we want people that although are coming in for a machine learning job they should be able to pick up some computer vision things um everybody at our company right now can do things with hardware. Um, everybody at our company right now has been to a fish farm as not, we're all computer scientists. So we knew nothing about aquaculture for the most part. So now we do. Um, so we've all learned. And I think that's me personally, that's the most valuable skill as an employee is the fact that they can learn quickly and they can take it upon themselves to um, take in what's going on with the company and learn what's going on. And the tricky part of that is um, that's not a that's not a learned skill. That's some of those are innate characteristics in someone, right? If you're, it's more adaptable and flexible and learn quickly. If there's an aptitude and interest in it, right? Yeah, um, that's tough. I, yeah, I have no idea. Um, it, if you got the drive, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about the knowing of. That's uh, learned. Well, I think more it, you're having the drive. I think that's the point. You want someone yeah. motivated to figure things out. Yeah, exactly. That's something we. That's something I specifically look for when. Um, it sucks because COVID happened, but we had this person lined up that was uh, perfect for how what our our path was. Um, However, we had to push deadlines and stuff with companies because we're not allowed on site anymore. But he showed all the characteristics. He was independently reaching out to, like, um, I met him and then he ended up finding my email and reaching out to me. Um, he did, he showed no background actually in computer science, but he ended up creating these 
underwater cameras for as well as uh, software stuff with Arduinos and um, Raspberry Pis, and he had really no background in it. Um, so that's that would have been our next hire if COVID didn't happen. For, for sure. Um, are there any other questions anyone wants to unmute sure. themselves? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, my question is more on technical side. So have you considered using the transfer learning techniques for the deep learning models? Because uh, as, as you said, you have gathered the data uh, manually. And I think uh, training the model on the uh, solely on the mm. manual data, mm. that would not give you the uh, best possible result. So uh, that is my first question. And the second question is, how did you achieve the 96% accuracy? Because in the presentation, you said at the end, uh, you have achieved the 0.96 accuracy for the uh, data set. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't hear what your first question was, but the second question was, how do we achieve 96% accuracy? Yes. Um, yeah, so, Sorry, can you please mute? Um, how do we achieve it? Yeah, I guess with standard methods, we, uh, one of our machine learning engineers, um, as we were doing a deliverable for a client, we had to do really maximize the, uh, so it's the accuracy on an individual fish is different than the ac accuracy on a population. So, um, which was uh, kind of a little bit of a breakthrough for us over the last year as well. So, um, but long story short, how did we do it? We ended up analyzing our data sets um, when we had lower accuracy, seeing what was actually wrong with them, spending hours literally going through images of fish and kind of understanding what was wrong with our data set. Um, removing outliers um, was big. And then, um, then there was the whole finding the appropriate model, understanding um, that fish grow differently and how to choose a model that um, can ad adapt to that as, as fish uh, kind of change with uh, thermorphometrics uh, find a model. So throwing an SVM at uh, at our data set was wasn't a thing to do. You can really bang, like get the mean on a distribution. But um, so uh, our machine learning engineer Pedram did a, an amazing job doing all that. Um, he found uh, an awesome model that uh, was great. Um, as well as did all the outlier detection with um, Pedram, Will, and Sam did a lot of that, and really that's that's what we did was really just data cleaning, data engineering, and making sure that the model that you have fits the data that you're working with. Great. And the first question was around transfer learning, asking about your training on the manual data, and if there was. In terms of, um, maybe you can pop back in and re-ask that question. Yeah. So my my question was, uh, like since you have the data that is manually gathered, uh, my question is like, it will not give you the uh, best result in terms of the data density. Right, so have you used out. any transfer learning techniques to uh, uh, increase your accuracy over the data set? Um, so, with respect to the AI stuff, I, I specifically, um, I don't know as much as uh, the engineers at the company, so would be able to dive into the transfer learning things. So uh, I couldn't dive too much into that, but with respect to my area of expertise, the next step we have on the board would be to again, take another look at the data set that we have um, and see if we can manipulate it in any way that can produce better results. So it'd be more of a, uh, I guess, a data science slash um, data engineering approach more than the machine learning approach. But um, if, if I had uh, my engineers with me, I'm sure Will or Pedram would, uh, would have 
jumped on that question. Thanks very much. Um, is there any other questions that we have out there? So not really a question. Um, Chris from Deep Sense, but I could maybe expand more on the question I just asked and I don't know, maybe it would be an interesting project in the future. So transfer learning, which you may or may not know, is the idea that you take a different model and then you train it on your own data. And then if you had a lot of good data for that original model, then you learn more on the new data. But I think in this context, there probably aren't many people that are using machine learning to weigh things. So I'm not sure that you would have an off-the-shelf model to do that with. Actually, um, I just got a message on Slack from oh. the engineers, and they just uh, stated that we are using transfer learning already. Oh, there you go. Uh, the object detection models that Will is uh, using do use transfer learning. Right. That makes a lot of sense for the object detection. Uh, I guess for the weighing, I think, would be difficult uh, to do transfer learning. I see what you're saying. But yeah, that, no, that makes perfect sense because there's so many vision models for detecting objects. Um, and then I guess the, uh, to your, your point of your next steps, um, probably one of the things you might want to look into is data augmentation. So can you do things like, you know, stretching and modifying your data or, you know, um, uh, using physical models of the size of fish and expanding the size of the fish and then using that as data. So you just kind of would have more data. That's one way you might be able to leverage the data set you have without actually collecting more data. Yeah, that's a good, uh, we apparently, uh, we have looked at this as well. So I'm getting- I figured. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have inconclusive results to this point with doing that. Uh, fish are weird uh, because yeah. they, uh, it's, this is something as people within CS, we didn't really know too much about the industry and about biology but um, fish grow, the morphometrics change as they grow bigger. So the distance between the eye and the fin at the back, it's called the dorsal fin, change, the, the lengths really don't grow um, proportionately as the rest of the fish grows. So um, it's, it's hard to do stretches and change the ratios of lengths and heights and everything because that, uh, kind of throws everything off from my model but i'm again i'm sure i'm going to end up getting uh messages on slack here that's saying i um might be wrong about it um but um i'm thanks for the input i'm sure that um Pedram and will will probably end up looking into it if, if, if i am wrong and thank you are there any other questions? I'm just looking through the chat just to make sure. So I was on mute for a little bit as it was rambling on and I could just re-talk about what I was saying. Well, we heard you. Oh, did you? You just didn't hear us as oh. we were asking questions. Oh. And um, yeah, we thought that you were just either ignoring the questions because oh. maybe they uh, were were too um, too complex, or also you did we weren't sure. We were like, oh no, it's just if you not can you not hear? So we're very happy that you're able to hear us, and we can hear everything you were saying. You came up with some or get, shared some great lessons, learners, and challenges that organizations face. And I think so. When I go back to, I mean, why this session's even happening is deep sense is to help companies better understand data. I think you're a fascinating organization because you had to go and collect net new data. It's not like your customers even had. Data. You had to go find the data for your future customers too. So you're creating a, a, you're addressing a need that people maybe knew they had but didn't know there was a solution for, which is sometimes very different than other organizations. So um, what you've done is, is it's fascinating, creating your own data, creating your own method to collect it, creating your own analysis of it, um, transfer learning or not. Um, it's It's been, fascinating to hear about how you guys have gone about doing it and the talent that you have in your team and how you work together and collaborate. And uh, I think this has been really helpful and hopefully eye-opening for the rest of those who are listening and, and watching this to hear about how um, you can use a couple of different types of data pieces and inputs to build out a whole new company. Awesome. So unless there's any other questions, I'm gonna go with now. Thank you so much, Matt, and the rest of your behind the scenes messengers on Slack for um, <laughs> helping keep us on track.
we really appreciate you taking time to share with us and look forward to seeing more about where you guys go. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, it was great to chat. I appreciate it. And um, if anybody ever wants to reach out, um, uh, my email is matt.zamola at realdata.ai. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, we, have, we use LinkedIn and Twitter for our social. So reach out to us. Um, we're happy to chat. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Great. Bye, Thanks, everybody.